Hello, and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam, and on this channel, I'll attempt to describe the science behind stilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully, it'll whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video, I'm going to talk about the magic boiling myth, vapor pressure, boiling, and evaporation. It's a little more on the technical side, but I don't think it'll be too difficult, and it'll help you understand a lot of what's going on inside your still. So let's get started. So there are some things I need to explain before I get to the point of this video on the magic boiling myth. The actual myth part is pretty short compared to the rest of what I'll explain. And you'll understand why when we get to it. I also wanted to touch on something else involving flavors and cuts, and that'll be at the end of the video. So the things I needed to explain before I get to the magic boiling myth are vapor pressure, boiling, and evaporation. So what is vapor pressure? Strictly speaking, vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by the gas above a liquid inside a closed system. When they are at equilibrium. And by equilibrium we mean when there's an equal amount of liquid evaporating and gas condensing at the same time. So let's say we vacuumed out this bottle so there's absolutely nothing inside there and then we fill it half full with 20 degrees celsius 68 degree fahrenheit water just pure water. Let it sit and equilibrate. If we were to measure the pressure of the vapor above the liquid so the head space we would measure 2.34 kilopascals or 0.34 psi. We would call this the vapor pressure of x, whatever it is. In this case, it would be the vapor pressure of water. Outside of a closed system though, you don't reach equilibrium. A vapor gets carried away. Uh, you know, maybe the liquid and the vapor are warmer than the atmospheric temperature, so it'll move out because it's less dense. Maybe just simple Brownian motion will carry it away. Regardless, the vapor pressure in an open system still plays a role in that the upward vapor pressure of the vapor just at the surface of the liquid is counteracting the downward pressure of the atmosphere. So instead of molecules coming off the surface and just bouncing into the walls of the enclosed vessel, it'll be literally bumping into the downward moving uh, or the downward pushing gases in the atmosphere. So we still use the term to denote the pressure exerted by the vapor above the liquid as if it was in a closed system because it's also an indicator of volatility and boiling point. At a given temperature, let's say again, 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, a compound with a higher vapor pressure will have more molecules in the gas phase above the liquid. An example, we have the vapor pressure of water here in blue, 2.34 kilopascals or 0.34 PSI. In the purple here is acetone, 24.57 kilopascals or 3.56 PSI. So it's about 10 times higher. So that essentially means there's about 10 times more molecules of acetone than water. And we generally know this because of what's called the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT. So P is pressure, V is volume, N is the amount of substance, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is temperature. So we're not changing the volume. Let's say we have two of these, one has water in it, one has acetone. We're not changing the volume. They both have the same volume in there. They're both at the same temperature and the constant isn't changing because it's a constant. That means in order to get a higher pressure, you need a greater amount of substance as a gas above the liquid. In this case, the acetone has 10 times as much. That's why we consider acetone to be quite volatile. So that's essentially what vapor pressure is. So now we can talk about the property called boiling or boiling point. And I'm going to be talking about it as if it's in an open system. Okay, so boiling. Probably know a bit about it. It's a phase change from liquid to gas. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. What you may not know is that boiling happens when there's enough kinetic energy in the molecules of the liquid that they can spread out and become a gas. Bubbles will form and they'll float to the top because they are less dense than the liquid. Uh, when the bubbles hit the surface, they pop and the vapor escapes the liquid. So the temperature at which this happens the boiling point temperature is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of that compound is slightly higher than local atmospheric pressure. I say local atmospheric pressure because you, if you change the atmospheric pressure, the boiling point temperature also changes because that atmospheric pressure is either increasing its force downwards on the vapor and liquid or it's decreasing that force. So where I live around 1200 meters or 4000 feet elevation above sea level, the boiling point temperature is 96 degrees Celsius or 205 degrees Fahrenheit. So when I put a pot on the stove to make some pasta, this is the temperature at which it boils. This is because the atmospheric pressure way up here is 87.5 kilopascals or 12.7 PSI. So that means 
When the water reaches the temperature of 96 degrees Celsius, 205 degrees Fahrenheit, its vapor pressure is slightly above that 87.6 kilopascals, and it's at 87.7 kilopascals, or 12.72 psi. So it's a relatively tiny increase, but it's enough that the water can start boiling. Those of you at sea level, where the atmospheric pressure is 101.3 kilopascals, or 14.7 psi, when the water reaches 96 degrees Celsius, 205 degrees Fahrenheit, it's only at 87.7 kilopascals, or 12.72 psi. That's not enough to overcome the pressure of the atmosphere. But when you continue to add heat energy, which is adding more kinetic energy to the molecules, when you get to 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of the water is now 101.4 kilopascals, 14.71 psi. So now it's higher than atmospheric and now it can start to boil and release that vapor in mass amount. And the boiling technically happens all throughout the bulk of the liquid and not just on the surfaces. Okay, so we've talked about vapor pressure and boiling. Now we can talk about a simpler concept, evaporation. Evaporation is a surface phenomenon. And by that it means it only happens at the gas liquid interface, the surface of the liquid. This happens at any and all temperatures where the gas is a gas and the liquid's a liquid. Um, it's why a glass of water on your countertop will drop in volume if you just leave it there. Evaporation is the effect of the molecules on the surface getting enough kinetic energy that they can overcome any intermolecular forces keeping them in the liquid and they just fly off the surface. So the water molecules, the blue ones here, hydrogen bonding between other water molecules will try and keep them in place. But you can have enough kinetic energy just at room temperature that one molecule will come flying in and smash into another one like a billiard ball, that other one being on the surface, and it'll just go flying off the surface. And since it's an open vessel, it'll just fly out. And that happens millions of times per second. Some of them don't get very far and they may recondense back into the liquid, but eventually the, li the level of the liquid will start to drop just from the evaporation. So as you add more heat or more heat energy to the liquid, more molecules move around, they go flying off into the at atmosphere, and this is why you start to get liquid coming out of your still early on, way before you ever hit the boiling points of any of those compounds that are present in there. If you have windows in your still like I do, you'll start to see condensing vapor throughout the still. You'll start to see it slowly move up the column as more and more vapor is being produced. And at low temperatures, I notice it coming in at around, uh, usually around, for me, it's usually in the 40s when I start to see vapor condensing on the surface. So now we can get to the magic boiling myth. For those that don't know, the magic boiling myth is the idea you can take a complex mixture, like a wash, put it into a still, get that still to a certain temperature, like the boiling point of a specific compound, and then only that compound will come out of the still as a distillate. So you get it to 40 degrees and green comes out, 50 degrees and purple comes out, 60 degrees and black comes out, and so on. We know by now that this generally won't be true. For one, we know it's a mixture of different compounds. We know that since it's a mixture of different compounds, some of those compounds are going to have molecules sitting at the surface. And we know that the more heat we add to the wash, the more those compounds are going to evaporate off the surface. So nothing that comes out the product condenser is ever going to be pure, practically speaking. And this leads me to the last thing I wanted to touch on, which is flavors and cuts. Uh, and this is also part of the magic boiling myth in that it also shows that boiling points don't matter. So here's something to think about. Digging back into uh, elementary and high school science classes, or in my previous videos, we know that less dense things will sit on top of more dense things. Oil is less dense than water, so oil floats on top of water. We know that some things aren't soluble in other things. Oil isn't soluble in water and vice versa, so you mix them together and they'll separate. So knowing what we know about evaporation, what do you think will happen to a compound that is insoluble or has a very low solubility in water and is less dense than water, even if it has a boiling point higher than water? We can look at isoamyl acetate as an example. Isoamyl acetate is an ester. It's created from a combination of isoamyl alcohol and acetic acid. It has a banana or fruity flavor and aroma depending on the concentration. If you've ever eaten banana runts, that's what isoamyl acetate tastes like. It has a boiling point of 142 degrees Celsius, 288 degrees Fahrenheit. Its density is 0.876 grams per cubic centimeter. I don't know what the imperial version for density would be, um, but water's density is only one gram per cubic centimeter. So isoamyl acetate is less dense than water. It also has a very low solubility in water. 
So what do you think is going to happen to the isothermal acetate? It's going to float to the, it's going to want to float to the surface. And what happens at the surface? Evaporation happens. So we have this really high boiling point compound that's sitting at the surface and it's going to evaporate away. And there's usually so little isothermal acetate that most of it will evaporate quite early on. So if you're running your still as a pot still with no plates, no packing, or maybe only a few plates and packing, you'll find the largest quantities come out of isothermal acetate will come out in the heads cut or the head heads hearts transition area and then the quantities will usually taper off from there if it has some solubility and it'll stretch throughout the hearts possibly all the way into the tails or sometimes it just tapers off quickly it depends on what compound you're talking but I have some uh, sheets here from a study so we can see isothermal acetate the first so this is a 350 liter distillation they did here they took 12 cuts and then they tested each cut for chemical composition so for the first three cuts which would be the heads and and the heads to hearts transition, there was 41 milligrams per liter. Then in the next five cuts, there was 18 milligrams per liter. And then in the last cut, there was 1.2, or sorry, the last three cuts, I should say, the tail section and the hearts to tails transition, there was 1.25 milligrams per liter. So that's a pretty significant drop off after that transition. And at least with isoamyl acetate, since it's slightly or very slightly, I should say, uh, soluble in water and in ethanol, it's actually quite soluble in ethanol. You can, that's the reason why it's being stretched out because the ethanol and the water in the wash are trying to hold on to it. The opposite of these types of compounds would be something that's more dense and then it's either very soluble or slightly soluble and it would want to stick around in the wash or stick around at the bottom of the wash but they are there and they're usually the heavy oily compounds that you find in the tails. But generally speaking, you can look at the a specific compound's solubility and density, and it can give you a good idea where in the three main cuts, the majority of that compound uh, should and might show up. All right, and that's it for this video on boiling evaporation, vapor pressure, and the magic boiling myth. Before I sign off, I'd also like to mention running this channel gets expensive and I don't want to run ads. So I'm going to be setting up a Patreon. It's not ready yet, but I currently do have a PayPal donation uh, link you can use if you would like to donate. You don't have to. Uh, the link will be in the description. And then hopefully sometime this week, I will have a Patreon set up. And if you want to donate money to the channel and maybe receive some extra benefits, you can go that route as well. So I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more and have a great week.